Okay, so let's go ahead and start building our web API in .NET Core 2.0 that we can use as a sort of back end to our Angular 4 front end. So I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code once again to build out uh, this aspect of the course. Feel free to use Visual Studio if you're on Windows or any other text editor of your choice. I'm just going to be using Visual Studio Code for some consistency here and once again um, to enable you to follow along directly if you're working on a different operating system. So what we need to do first is we'll go ahead and make a new directory for our API project. And I'm just going to call this advantage.api and then we'll cd into that directory. Alright, so to create a new .NET Core 2.0 project, we can run .NET New Web API. And this is going to scaffold out a brand new web API project um, using .NET Core 2.0 um, with uh, Microsoft MVC. So we'll be using the MVC pattern um, to build out this web API. And we can open up Visual Studio Code if we just type code dot to open it up in this directory. Okay, so it's opened up here. And you can see some of the files that have been scaffolded out for us. So we have this uh, controllers folder here um, that contains a, this default values controller. You can see some of the various different routes that have been defined here and different types of HTTP methods. We've got a www root folder, which is currently empty. This is typically where static files are served from in a .NET Core application. We have a csproj file where we can define the various packages that we will require. Um, at this point in time, um, .NET Core 2.0 is using this ASP.NET Core.all library to um, contain most of the things that you'll be familiar with in .NET, such as Link and MVC and various other libraries, all kind of bundled up into a single library here. You can see that we have this app settings.development.json file and this app settings.json file. This is where we can play some of the uh, different configuration for our application. And um, we'll take a look here in a minute in the uh, program.cs file. Uh, but basically, we can build out um, different configurations for our app um, as it gets launched, depending on what environment we're launching from. And so settings in our app settings dot development or dot production or dot staging or you know any other type of environment will get overwritten here um, by this uh, particular JSON file um, with the base version of that config config file basically being this app settings dot JSON file. Okay, then we have this program dot cs. This contains the main method, which is sort of the entry point of our application. You can see we're calling this build web host. And what this is, is using the builder pattern to basically create a default web builder. So a lot is kind of packed into the default web builder here. It's going to create the sort of default web host here using Kestrel as a, as a server, setting the hosting environment, um, loading our configurations from our app settings and that sort of thing. And then it's called from our main method and we call dot run on it to start up the application. So we won't be dealing too much here in our program.cs file, um, but if we take a look in our startup.cs file, this is um, a place where we will be making some modifications and some additions to here. Notice that um, we've got two methods here inside of our startup class. We've got this configure services method. This will be where we register the various services that will be in use in our application. You can see that by default, um, MVC is implemented as a service here in configure services. And then we have this configure method. And so this is where we sort of configure our middleware or our HTTP request pipeline. So you can see that, um, for instance, if we are working in the development environment, then we can use the developer exception page. We can put any other type of logic here um, that's contingent upon a particular hosting environment. We tell our app to use MVC here, and this will be where we define things like the way that our routes work, and we'll also be implementing things like a data seeder later in the, uh, the section here on the API, 
where we'll populate our Postgres database with uh, some sample data that'll make it more interesting uh, from a front end perspective as we um, are sort of building out charts and different types of visualization. Okay, so that's just a quick rundown of some of the files that were scaffolded out for us. We're going to keep this aspect of the course relatively simple. I would uh, consider the main focus of this course still to be on Angular 4 development, um, but I thought it would be worthwhile to cover building out a very lightweight, simple web API in .NET Core 2.0, um, if only to show you how to build one. Um, but that said, yeah, it's going to be quite simple, and we won't get into all the various uh, details that go into a .NET Core 2.0 application, but we will be building a functional web API. And this is also good because you'll be able to use this API for other front ends that you might develop, either other Angular applications or if you're working with React or other front end frameworks, um, you'll be able to share this API across various different uh, front ends that you build and it might be something useful to have sort of in your toolbox. All right? If you're using Visual Studio Code, you'll get this warning that uh, you're missing packages so we can go ahead and add them. And when we do that, we should see this uh, .vs code folder here. We have this launch.json file, and we have a task.json file. So we won't be talking too much about these, but we will let them live here in the VS code um, sort of hidden directory. So we can go ahead and close this. And we're going to keep a pretty flat project structure here. If I was building a more uh, complex or a larger web API, um, then you would definitely see me build out different parts of the application in different projects, um, different class libraries. So um, if you've seen my course on .NET Core 2.0, when we built out the sort of data layer for our application, we created a separate project and all of the code that interacted with our database lived solely in that project. Now, this is sort of a, a much smaller project, just an aspect of this uh, entire Angular 4 course. And so as a result, and as a result of this uh, particular application um, being relatively simple, we're going to have uh, just a single API project and we'll have all the files that we need to get up and running um, just contained in this single project. So we'll start off by creating a models folder and here's where we'll define our entity models for our API. So if you recall, um, when we were building our front end, we basically were displaying data about customers, about orders that customers placed, and then about um, these server objects, which we are just using to kind of represent uh, some entity in a database that might represent the state of some server that we have um, as part of our business. So we have three entity models there. So let's go ahead and create them. So inside the models directory, we're going to create a new file. The first one we'll call customer.cs. And so we'll namespace it here, advantage.api.models. We have a public class customer. And we'll have a public int ID, which we can create our sort of auto property here. Um, so it's just going to be a POCO class with the properties of our customer. So we'll keep things simple, um, kind of simplified, if you will. We'll have a customer name, um, which will be a string. And we'll have a customer email, which will make a string. And then we're going to really simplify things here. And rather than sort of a complex address, we'll have just a single string property for the customer's state. And we'll use that to display perhaps orders by state or you know top states by number of orders or something like that on our dashboard. Obviously, if this were more complex or complete uh, web API, then your customer object would be much more complex than just having these four properties defining it. But for our purposes, it'll be perfect. So we'll go ahead and create another file here for order.cs. I'm going to go ahead and copy the namespace from the customer and paste it here. So we'll have public class order. 
and our order will have a primary key ID as well, which will just be an int, just like our customer object. And now we'll use our customer object to represent a customer property on our order. So customers, so every order will belong to a customer. We have a public decimal order total. This will represent the amount of money paid for a particular order. And then we'll have two date values. We'll have a date time placed. Um, let's call let's call the uh, order total. We'll just call this uh, total. And a date time object here for when the order was placed. And then we'll have a nullable date time value for when the order was completed. And we make it nullable because we want to store dates for orders that have been completed, but obviously um, when an order is first placed, it will not yet be completed, and yet we'd still like to store some information about it. And so we'll make the completed property on it nullable. And then to use the uh, date time type, we just need to bring in uh, system namespace. Okay, so let's create our third and final entity model here, server.cs. So again, I'm just going to copy uh, using the same namespace here. And we'll have a public class server and a public int ID. And then finally, we'll have a string name to represent the server name. And we'll have, let's say, a bool um, is online to represent whether or not this uh, particular server is online. Okay, um, so. Moving rather quickly here, let's go ahead and create our DB context. So once again, if you have experience using Entity Framework or building web applications with ASP.NET Core or even previous versions of ASP.NET, then you will be familiar with the idea of a DB context. So the DB context is, um, in a sense, one of the most important parts of uh, any project that you define using Entity Framework. So DB context can be sort of thought of as the, the thing that represents the connection between your um, entity models that we create in code here and their representation in some database. So it kind of helps, I think, to think of DB context as your database. And then within our DB context, we'll define some DB sets, which you can kind of think of as tables. So we'll have collections of servers and collections of orders and collections of customers, which are represented by rows in a table in a database somewhere. Um, so why don't we just go ahead and we'll create our DB context for this project. So we'll create a new file here and I'm going to call this API context.cs. And we'll need to use Microsoft.entity framework core here. And then our namespace will be the same here, advantage.api.models. And we'll have this public class API context. And we're going to extend DB context. So again, this will kind of represent our database or a session with a particular database of our choosing. And so let's set that up here in our constructor. So we'll create a constructor API context. We're going to pass this some DB context options. And we'll use our API context type here. And we'll pass those to the base class here in this cat, in this case, uh, DB context. We'll go ahead and pass the options. And now we'll define our DB sets. So we're going to want a DB set for each type that we have created. So in other words, this will generate a table for each of our types in a database. So we're going to have a DB set of customer objects. And we'll name that table. You can think of it once again as a table um, customers. Uh, 
Likewise, we'll have two more DB sets, one for each of our types. So we have orders and we have servers. Okay, so that's how we define our very simple DB context here. So we're gonna have three tables, one table corresponding to each entity model, and we'll have a single DB context for this application called API context. So what I'd like to do now is I'm gonna go ahead and make a commit. So we'll head back to the command line and notice that we don't have a git repo here. So we can go ahead and create one just with git init. And now we'll git add dot and we'll go ahead and git commit and I'll just call this initial commit. Okay, so we'll go ahead and minimize this. So to get started with any of this, we need to visit our csproj and add some new packages to our item group of package references. And we'll also add a new .NET CLI tool reference as well. So here in the item group, I'm just gonna go ahead and copy uh, the previous line. And here we're gonna bring in Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore that design. All of this will be version 2.0.0. We'll bring in Microsoft Entity Framework Core dot tools. And we'll also bring in npg SQL dot entity framework core dot postgresql. So this is the library that will allow us to use um, a Postgres database as a backend um, and allow Entity Framework to communicate with it. VS Code will tell us that there are unmet dependencies and so we can restore. You can also restore packages by just using .NET Restore from the command line. And now I'm going to add a new item group here with our .NET CLI tool reference. In this case, uh, we'll be using Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.Tools dot dot net again version 2.0.0 okay so that's all looking pretty good and actually let's add one more dot net CLI tool reference here to manage uh, secrets in our application so this is going to be useful um, when we're building our connection string so that we don't need to actually hard code um, a password into the connection string because we definitely want to keep that out of source control so here we'll bring in Microsoft that extensions that secret manager dot tools again version 2.0.0 and now we'll head over to the terminal and we'll run dot net restore so the uh, package is restored for us and now we can test this out um, the secrets aspect out if we dot net uh, user secrets dash h we can see uh, some of the various commands that we can use to manage the secrets that we might require for our application. So this secret manager tool will operate on project specific uh, config settings that are stored in our user profile. I'll provide a link to the .NET Core docs um, where you can find out more information about the secret manager. For instance, where the uh, JSON configuration file for them is stored uh, depending on your operating system, for instance. On Windows, this will be in our app data folder under Microsoft and then in a directory called user secrets. Um, but let's just go ahead and set it up for our application. So in our CS Prowse still under target framework, let's go ahead and provide a user secrets ID. And this shouldn't matter so much, um, the value here, but we'll just call it user secret ID. 